So good morning, everybody. My name is Kevin Motar, and I will be your host for today. Well, this video is maybe a little bit like fintech. You know, this statement, once you think you've got all the answers, it changes the questions. But we are very proud from the European Fintech Organization to have so many of you here today. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit what started as a dream nine months ago to bring all the leaders in European fintech on the continent together for the first time. Today became a reality. And if you look at those figures, more than 400 delegates, more than 50 fintech investors, more than 50 innovation heads, more than 100 fintech CEOs, more than 50 judges, more than 400 nominees, and more than 60,000 votes. I think we can say that that dream became a reality. And I want to start today by bringing forward and asking for an applause for my colleague and the person that made all of this possible, Teun van der Weeke. Well, good morning, Tun. Good morning. Well, my first question, of course, is if you invite all these people to your party, why have you invited them? Um, first of all, thank you for the applause and for having me and for arriving here because you guys make, make this event, obviously. Um, I invited all you guys because I think that everyone needs to learn. And what I noticed is that everyone is really uh, eager to know what is happening in all um, European fintech uh, countries separately. And that's why we thought as an organization, but obviously you guys as well, because you all showed up, that it's a good idea to learn from each other and to come here together. So, of course, today, the start of the European fintech community. What do you hope to achieve with this European fintech community? Um, I hope that all delegates and, and judges and speakers will, will learn from each other, talk to each other. And I hope that in, in just one day, people get a sort of holistic view of what is happening in the, in the European fintech space. That will be great. And what that holistic view is there, we will be touch upon later after the opening keynote when we will go through the program people can attend today. But thank you very much for now, Tun. <laughs> to open this first ever European FinTech Awards, we wanted to get the most <clears throat> energetic, the most dynamic, the most innovative speaker possible. And everybody that knows him says he is. And everybody that doesn't know him yet will say after this speech, he is. So I give a, please give a huge hand to our opening keynote speaker, David Breer. That's a, a very big introduction, isn't it? So um, and, uh, hopefully um, I'll, I'll try and sort of fulfill on the basis of, uh, of, of that. I, I should say um, yesterday I, I presented somewhere and about 15 minutes into it, a fire alarm went off. So um, I kind of joked that it was a bank somewhere that didn't like what I was saying at the time type thing. So if it happens two days in a row, then uh, I'll look for the people who were consistent in the audience and uh, I'll be able to kind of figure out who it was. But um, as, uh, as was said, um, my name is David Breer. Um, I'm here to give you, and I think the, the kind of of lofty title is what is going wrong with banking uh, which I, I think is quite a loaded title especially for a lot of the people in the audience as it goes but um, let's start it and see where we get to and then uh, and then you can tell me if you agree as, as we sort of go through um, I think the the interesting thing about understanding where we're going with banking and actually where we've uh, where we've been you kind of need to understand the the context of, of the, the pieces so if we look at kind of where we are today uh, you know, this is a good, I think, representation of where most banks are. And if you look sort of backwards, let's say, to the 1990s in terms of where we've been, um, just did it, people notice the transition between the two of those things, just so I'm clear? So just this is kind of where we are, this is where we've been, where we are, where we've been. Um, just somebody like to have a real good guess at what the, the big difference is between these two things? Nobody? Nobody want to have a guess? It's about £15 billion. Pounds. So about £15 billion pounds was actually spent between these two points, actually making not a huge amount of change happen. And I think this is the, this is the sign of the, the times, really. You know, the, the analogy that I've used a lot, and I know it's sort of getting a little bit trife in terms of what it's doing, is that you know, banking has become a little bit of a dinosaur. You know, it's sort of slow and lumbering. Some of them don't exist anymore in terms of what we're doing. And there's a lot of reasons why that is the case. Um, and I'm going to try and sort of unpack that a little bit for you today and, and go through some of those things. I think the first one when, when we see it is, is trust. And, and a lot is, is kind of made in this, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of these statistics before. 
But when the only industry that is actually less trusted than you is the media industry, which are, you know, they're literally tapping people's phones, chasing them down streets. You know, they're the guys who are less trusted than financial services at the moment. That's probably not a good sign, is it, in terms of where we're going? So, you know, trust and trust from a customer's perspective is going to be a big thing. In terms of operating costs, and I, and I think this is such a, a large limiting factor in terms of what, what happens in a lot of these organizations, and I'll, and I'll touch on why in a, a little bit, but you know, at the point where it, it costs a, a global bank around about somewhere between 140 and 170 pounds to run a current account, but a challenger bank can do it for, any, again, anybody want to have a, a good guess at where we're, we're going here? Top, top end about four quid? You know, the, the, it's like night and day, and this is not just from a technology perspective that these things are kind of spiraling in from, a, from an operating cost, but, you know, many other elements as well in terms of the processes, the amount of people that it takes to do things, and that, I think, is quite, quite a scary fact. If you're not scared yet, you will, will be here by the end of it. Um, fintech investment, for all the fintechs in the room, then uh, I'm sure this is a, a very happy sign from, from your perspective, but the fact that there's so much investment in people looking for alternative ways of, of doing banking and financial services, we've seen about 50 billion over the last five years invested. That is phenomenal. You know, for looking for alternate ways of doing things. You know, this is a, a phenomenal amount of money that people are, are bringing to the table to really enable change happening. And people with this are getting incredibly competitive. I, I love this. Um, I was lucky enough to be in uh, Downing Street, actually, when uh, Harriet Baldwin and uh, the EY, who actually did this study, unveiled it. And I thought it was a little bit funny, if I'm honest with you. Anybody who basically commissions a study from a, uh, somebody to do something that comes out on top of it, I call a little bit suspect, if I'm honest with you. you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you, you sort of pay for it yourself and somebody does it and you come out on top, you can celebrate it that much. But you know, I'm happy that the UK come out on top, obviously, given my accent. Um, but I, I think the interesting thing about this is, actually, if you, if you kind of flip this table, if you look at you know, Hong Kong, Australia, Germany, actually, some of those guys are, are actually much more productive from a bank's perspective than necessarily, I would say, the, the banks in the UK, California, New York are. So you know, maybe the, the thing that we're sort of seeing here in terms of the, the tradition part of it is more innovative banks, there is less opportunity for fintech. And definitely, I think that is a, a very strong reason for why in the UK, actually, we're seeing such rise of fintech because actually the banks just aren't very good at really capitalizing on what they need to do. So moving through, new competitors. You know, if there wasn't a good reason to be terrified, it's all the new people coming into the market. And some of these guys are exceptional. You know, I, for, I, I use Mondo on a daily basis. You know, I've kind of replaced it, my Lloyd's current account with it as, as much as I possibly can do until they, they really get, get live. But with Atom and Fedor and uh, Tandem, you know, there are really powerful com companies that are coming into the market that are not just trying to support what the organizations are doing. You know, if you look at every element, and I'm sure you've seen this, uh, this diagram before, but every element of banks are being picked up by a, a smaller player who are focusing incredibly hard on, on making that the best thing that they can possibly do. Now, can they scale that is, is a challenge, but it's sort of unquestionable that actually the services and capabilities that are being delivered by every one of those companies are adding much more value to the customer experience than any of the banks are at the moment. From a regulation perspective, and this was touched on a little bit at the, at the beginning, the amount of change that we've seen from a regs perspective, and not just with things like PSD2 coming along, but actually with regards to making it easier for competitors to come in. You know, since, since 2008, um, you know, we've seen the regulators shift dramatically from a, a kind of a stone wall garden in terms of keeping people out and protecting the banking organizations to fundamentally opening up and allowing people to come in. And I think that change in mentality and de-risking some of the, the, the big guys is really why we're seeing the, the flourish of in, interesting things happening. And that, those competitors coming in, I think, really sort of lowers the, the bank's opportunity to say, you know, we don't care, nobody else is doing anything, so therefore, why should we? So with all these new people coming in and things like what was announced um, earlier on this week, actually, with people like the FCA running a, a sandbox in terms of allowing uh, people to take products to market, almost in an alpha, beta mentality approach, you know, this is really maturing a market that we haven't seen today. Legacy debt is getting much harder to deal with. You know, for anybody in a bank, this is kind of the, the millstone around your neck in terms of what you're doing. You know, it's the technology that we put in place. It's the governance that we put in place. It's the, even down to stupid things like procurement in terms of doing things. 
you know, for anybody who's a kind of a startup in, in the comp in, a, in the room, you know, if you've tried to work with any very very large organisations in the the last uh, last few years, you know, they may be very very positive about doing work with you, but as soon as you hit the procurement department, you're in problems. You know, actually getting through the 50 pages of documents that you need to do and all of the triple checks of where you need to get to before you're allowed to do anything, and then probably being asked to have maybe like a million pounds worth of indemnity insurance before you're allowed on the property. You know, these are the types of things that really need to evolve in terms of where we are. From a management perspective, and you'll forgive, you'll forgive me, I'm a big fan of Dilbert, but, um, I, and it comes out at least once every presentation that I do. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of sort of kind of saltiness from a management perspective that we're, we're kind of seeing. The idea that actually having 35 years or 40 years of, of banking experience might not be the best advantage that you actually need in the, the way that we're, we're sort of moving. So, for example, something like blockchain that has only existed for a, for a couple of years in earnest in terms of what we're doing, then actually what is it about somebody who's been in a bank for 25 years that's actually going to be a better experience than, than something of, of somebody with infinite capability from, a, from blockchain? It just doesn't make any difference. And, and I think, you know, Dilbert, I like his articulation, but Accenture have done some work to kind of actually quantify this. So, you know, on the basis that we've only got 3% of CEOs at leading banking organizations with real technology experience, given it's such a large investment in terms of what the banks are doing and how they're doing it, that's quite a terrifying thing, isn't it? It's like having a kind of a Formula One driver who's only been driving for about a week in terms of what they're doing. It just doesn't seem sensible, does it? I do love this slide, and I'll apologize for it. I, I like to caveat this with it. It wasn't a selfie that I took. I have to, to sort of tell you guys, this was a, this is a Google image in terms of doing it. But customer centricity at the moment is very much being led um, by profitability. And kind of what I mean by that really is, when you start looking at the, the sort of general rump that most of the banks can kind of go after, it makes it really difficult, given their operating costs and the, the processes that they've got in place, to kind of go above or beyond that. If they go above that and they start talking to high net worth customers who want more of a, an experience, more high touch, um, it's very difficult to keep that uh, service level up without really breaking the profitability of those customers. And going below that into the low income, so financial inclusion and really sort of offering something to, to enrich what the uh, bottom of the pyramid capability would, would actually need, it's almost impossible. You know, when you've got a £170 for a current account each year, trying to make the bottom of the pyramid profitable is almost impossible for most of the banking organizations. So it's, it's, it's quite sad, but it's being very much led by what they can make profitable. And I think this is a fundamental, and I, I can pick on Lloyd's Banking Group for, for a couple of reasons, but uh, one of them is that I used to work there, so I know that these guys have got pretty, uh, pretty thick skins in terms of what they're doing. But my kind of view is, is we've, we've digitized a lot of the, the mediums in terms of actually how we deliver products, but the products themselves have been the same for the last 300 years. You look at the, the products that are on offer from, from Lloyds Bank in terms of current accounts and credit cards and, and savings. These are, these are not new things. You know, from my perspective, this is like digitizing the, the medium without digitizing the product. You know, this is Apple selling vinyl through the iTunes store. It, it makes kind of no sense in terms of what you're doing. The marketplace has evolved so much. I don't get why the products haven't. So to sort of summarize this, I think there's a really good, you know, mentality to sort of take away from this really is... I'm a bit underwhelmed. You know, going back to the, the money that's being spent, the effort that's gone through, the hundreds of thousands of people that work for a lot of these organizations, why is the experiences that we've seen being so underwhelming in terms of what we're doing? You know, there's a very good example here. It's kind of, you can have any experience you want so long as it's the generic one that I'm putting in front of you now through our mobile or internet banking apps. And I think what we've seen here is digitization really is a, is a new concept that it's to deliver anything other than cost savings. You know, the first internet banking platforms, the first websites, the mobile apps, they're all about taking money out of the organization. And this is the major difference between the, the, the fintechs and actually the banks in terms of why they're investing in what they're doing. It's actually the, the fintechs that are coming into the space and the new banks that are being organized. It, it's experience first. It's as close to the customer as you can be to, to deliver really interesting capability. So the, the banking marketplace is, is kind of in flux. You know, we, we have the, the big legacy banking organizations with all of the customers. We have new brand challenges coming in trying to scale out in terms of where they are. We have the new startups entering the organization, sometimes sort of below the line. You know, they've got very good ideas, but actually, and in some instances, very large amounts of investment like, like Atom, but no customers. So 
they're challenging, but they're challenging from a conceptual perspective rather than necessarily challenging from a customer perspective yet. Most of these guys are, are kind of delineated in, in, by one major factor, in, in my opinion, which is core banking capability. Some of them on the left-hand side are going with more sort of traditional understanding of what core banking is and really trying to scale up in terms of their customers. You know, they can kind of only go straight up, more customers. They're kind of at the limits in terms of where they are at the moment. The people on the, the right-hand side of this, and there's, there's a few organizations, um, I'm not sure if Chris Gledhill's here, but people like Seco Bank, probably off this chart in terms of the right-hand side of this, this spectrum in terms of what they're doing from a, uh, from a technology perspective. But these guys are all trying to move up and to the right. So it's about developing the, te uh, the technology, developing the platform in terms of what they're doing, as well as scaling up. And we have this sort of looming threat in the background here, which is the technology firms. You know, there's a lot been written about whether Google or Facebook or Apple or all of these guys will come into the market. And that sort of looming threat, given that they've got more money to invest, they've got more customer base than most of the banking organizations on the planet, um, is really kind of a real one. You know, there's probably no boards on the, uh, no banking boards that haven't freaked out at some point about something that a technology firm might or might not do, um, which is in a, an interesting state to be. And I think that the question really is, what is it that the legacy banks are going to do? You know, where do they go from here? Even if they do decide that they want to do something, they, they kind of butt up very quickly with a culture. A culture of this is how it's been done, a culture of change averseness, because at, at its heart, you know, risky business, risky change is actually quite a terrifying thing to do. So why would you expose yourself to that level of risk? If, even if they get through that, there's an element of, of architectural problems. Now, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that once you kind of get through the, the, the culture piece and you actually through uh, leadership and through change setup actually enable people to do interesting things, then it is possible. The technology is relatively straightforward. You know, most people, I'm sure, given the uh, you know, smart people that we've got in the audience, most people with a, a whiteboard and a pen could actually write down the technology that's required. But in terms of the, the culture change, that stuff is really difficult to kind of get through. So I think it, Jack Welch probably said this best. If the rate of change on the outside of, exceeds the rate of change on the inside, then the end is near. And I think it's pretty damn clear that actually the rate of change inside and outside is somewhat different in terms of what we're seeing. There's lots of examples, and I'm not going to sort of labor the point in terms of what we've seen here, but there's huge amounts of examples of companies that haven't got this. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking to uh, Lisa Gansky a couple of weeks ago, who was the lady who delivered all of the digital photography capability in Kodak that they just decided they didn't want to do anything with. You know, I think there's a, there's a funny stat that, isn't it, something like 70% of people know who, it, uh, who are murdered know their killer. You know, that's quite an interesting analogy for what we're sort of seeing coming along. So I, I think the exciting thing and the main question I would say, really, from where we are, is not really what the banks are going to do. But actually, given all of the new interesting companies that are coming into this space, given all of the uh, excitement that we're seeing and investment we're seeing from a fintech perspective, what is it that the customers are actually going to do? And, and I think there's, a, there's good signs to, to show that what they're going to be doing. Um, you know, we've seen um, exceptionally bizarre things happen, and I, lo I love this, this photo, for, for example, type thing. But this is a good example of the unpredictability of what people will do. Um, this is a, a gentleman who was sat on the, the runway in Hong Kong who was quite hot and decided it was a good idea to open the door to get some fresh air. <laughs> He spent about three weeks in prison, as, I, as far as I understand it, but he was quite cool at the time, which is, which is good. So I think the air conditioning in Chinese prisons is quite good. So, um, but you know, if you're looking for the unpredictability of what customers will do, then this is an interesting example. And you know, number 26, they've acquired, I think it's 60,000 customers over the last quarter. That's quite amazing. You know, we've seen Mondo initially break a funding platform in terms of what they're doing and then uh, raise a million pounds in 96 seconds. You know, this is uh, amazing what we're seeing. And Atom, Atom, a bank with no customers, has been given 45 million by BBVA. I kind of think if this isn't a sign of change, then what is in terms of what we're doing? So I think the question is, what is going to happen in banking? And um, from my perspective, and there's a, a tried and trife, so don't, don't groan when you see this, okay? But I do think banking is at an uber moment, but not, not the one that kind of everybody goes on about. Not, not the, isn't their app wonderful, and the frictionless of the pain, blah, 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 blah. So that, that's not my, my point around it, is I think what Uber did to taxis was actually make taxi firms step their game up, right? 
So if you kind of look actually, you know, all of the reaction to it, people were in uproar. You're very similar to kind of what you saw with, with fintech, right? You know, the, initially the banks were freaking out saying, oh, fintech's terrible, it's never going to take off. You know, the, the kind of denial piece that we sort of see in the change curve in terms of where we are. But if, for anybody who's actually taken a London cab most recently, and, and I, I have to profess, I don't like Uber. You know, my, my experience with Uber is a, a very nice app uh, that, yes, I get frictionless of payments in terms of what I'm doing. But generally speaking, I'll get into a cab, which all intents and purposes feels like it's like the first day that person has ever either stepped foot in a car or stepped foot in a cab. So, you know, it's, it's like having a really nice waiter, but the food is terrible. And unfortunately, when I go out to eat, it's the food that I'm going for. So it's a kind of a weird setup. But what, what we're seeing in London now is that the taxi firms are having to sort of devolve a little bit. They're having to actually deliver a, a, a capable, interesting, good customer experience and be competitive from a price perspective. So I, I think what we should be seeing with, with banking really is, you know, the Uber, mo Uber moment has come. The ability to, to do nothing and not really up your game from an experiential perspective in terms of how you think about your customers, how you really connect with them through all of the capability, all of the technology, the excuses have passed. So that's me. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. Christina de Villeneuve and Herod Solom of BNP Paribas and uh, ABN AMRO are coming up. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about announcing them as dead man and dead woman walking. <laughs> but if I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. that's not really your opinion. No, I, I still believe that the banks have actually got everything in their lockers to, to really sort of make a, make a, make a change. It's, it's just when you look at the examples of the, the companies that I put up there, a lot of them chose not to do things with all of the, the ammunition, all of the facts, but you know, with all of the investment, with all of the people, and actually with the, the huge customer base that all of the banks have got, then they have everything to, uh, everything to lose, shall we say, at the moment. Um, it's really about, I think, over the next six, year, uh, six months to 12 months, the decisions that are going to be made are probably going to be what defines the market, I think, over the next five to ten years. Because if I understand you well, the chances are there. But how hopeful or how optimistic in their case are you that they will seize that moment? Um, well, I don't want to speak particularly about these two organizations, but as an industry as a, as a, as a whole, then um, you know, I think there are very good signs that people are doing interesting things. You know, we've, we've seen uh, very legacy organizations like MBank transform themselves into a kind of a market leader from an experiential perspective in terms of what they're doing. We're seeing very good signs from people like Santander in terms of their, their uh, alignment and their collaboration with, with fintech players. So you know, I believe change is possible, but it is damn hard. So uh, you know, making it happen is going to be really the challenge of all of the leaders in those companies. Well, good you're not saying what you think about. Is it still working? Yeah. Good you're still not, not yet saying what you think about BMP Paribas and ABN Amro, because I will now have a conversation with them. Sure. You and Jason Bates, the founder of Mondo, will be listening. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, we will do what we call grill the keynote, which means you and Jason will cross examine Gerrit and Christina. Sounds like fun. So I already introduced them a little bit, so I asked them now to come forward. Gerrit Solom, the CEO of ABN AMRO, our host today, and Christina de Villeneuve, the Chief Digital Officer of BMP Paribas. Hello. Welcome to the both of you. Maybe my first question, Gerrit, if you look at the presentation of David, what did you agree the most with, and were there things you disagreed with? I agreed most uh, with the element of culture which was uh, mentioned, because if you uh, have the traditional uh, hierarchy model, then you cannot make speed in a, in a large organization. So we should think about bringing responsibilities lower into the organization, having small teams working fast and agile, and that is a completely different way of working than with uh, pyramid and all these committees, etc. That will be one of the challenges uh, for banks because I think uh, we need more agility, flexibility, speed in order to cope with all the new possibilities. It's not only threats, it's also opportunities, of course. And where did you disagree with? <coughs> well, it was a bit provocative sometimes, but actually I like that, so <laughs> because that keeps you awake. His message sounded hopeful, but he actually said you have six 
to 12 months to get it fixed. Do you agree with that? Well, that's a bit of a short period, but certainly we are now reviewing our strategy and one of the major elements will be, of course, the digitization innovation, but also changing the way we work and changing the culture. Christina, same question for you. Yeah, well, I, I think that all the analysis is very right. We are definitely in a period where there's a lot of change, and I think you hit it right on the nail with the culture and the, and the IT architecture. Those are key issues. Um, I think that we have woken up. I think that we are aware of all that, and the fact that the pace of change is accelerating and that we have a lot of difficulties, hierarchical cultures, that, that we uh, you know, process things in a very uh, bureaucratic way, sometimes it may seem, and that that's not efficient today is very clear to us, and it has been the case for, for a while. Um, so I think that it, it's the way we address that, and, and we have, many of us, many of the big banks have been doing efforts, and, and we, we are doing much more every time. So I think the time frame is pretty good. I would extend it a little bit more to almost two years, but I think things need to happen now. And, and that's exactly what we are working on. So it's culture, the IT, and obviously there's all, a whole thing about the ecosystem, so we obviously need to partner and work more actively and not destroy the value when we acquire it and not uh, send away the talent that we already have. So we're focusing a lot on the talent, the people, the ideas, and how to get things done. And our time frame is very short. We, are, we want to get things done in, in a two-year time frame. So uh, I, I, I agree. It's an interesting moment, and I think there's a lot of complementarity. We were discussing with Jason yesterday. There's a lot of things that there's trouble they will have, there's trouble we will have, and let's see, let's see who wins. <laughs> well, let's talk about culture first. Many big companies like to talk about culture. It's very hard to measure. That's maybe also why everybody likes to work at it. Uh, but what do you mean by culture, Christina? The people, the attitudes, how they work. Could you describe it? What is it that you want to change? Oh, that's a, a big question. Well, you mentioned <clears throat> a couple of things like um, uh, a lot of people in the bank do not understand technology. And that, 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 is, that is something that is not good because then they are not able to seize opportunities. So it's a lot about them understanding uh, enough for them to be able to seize opportunities and to use the knowledge that they have of the financial services industry with fintechs or with people that are competent in all these things. Um, there is a whole thing about risk taking. We, we have been, you know, we have been taught, I was head of marketing for parts of the bank and I mean marketing people were taught not to be innovative, they had to be trustworthy, they had to be strong. When things were sent in the market they had to be very, very solid so it was long and it was all based on making sure everything worked correctly and that regulation was respected and that the customer understood what he was buying. Uh, today, that's not at all the ball game. It's about you know testing, and testing means admitting that you make mistakes, <laughs> and that's certainly not in the banking culture. We do not make any mistakes, uh, and we do not say when we do not um, understand what the customer wants. So there's a whole thing about a dialogue that that from less of an expert and much more of a dialogue, and that that's a tough thing. The risk taking, the testing, uh, those are things that we do not know how to do. Um, there's a whole thing about hierarchy and the fact that we, you know, there's a lot of centralized power and decision making always goes up and, and then decisions then take centuries to go down. Uh, so it's, it's, it's working in networks and again that takes a lot of different skills. You need to trust people, you need to uh, manage them, you need to bring value to them instead of controlling what they do and those are again things that need to change. So, so there's a lot of things that culture needs to work with. but. You know, what, what keeps me on a very positive note is that uh, the people that I cross, at least in, in Ben Pipahibar, are very aware of that, and many of them want that. They're, they're asking for empowerment. They want to make decisions. They, they want to take risks. They want to try things. They, need, they know they need to learn. So it's, it's, we can get the ball rolling pretty fast, and, and that's what's happening in certain business units. It, it does happen easily sometimes. It's not as tough as it looks. Talking about culture, Kenneth, also many people of ABN AMRO are watching us and hearing us here today. If you speak to entrepreneurs, they say, what's your culture? They say, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than for permission. Yeah. How is that at ABN AMRO, and is that a message you want to give to everybody of ABN AMRO yeah. here today? Yeah. Well, it's not a problem if you make a mistake as long as you learn from it. Mm -hmm. If you make systematically mistakes, then we have an issue. But making a mistake... It's not, an, it's not a problem, uh, because uh, everybody who wants to improve himself will make mistakes. 
So I'm not, uh, I'm not asking people to be perfect. I ask them to strive for perfectness, but you only realize that if you make mistakes once in a while. But you also change how you manage, how you coach, how you reward. Yeah, what, uh, what we are doing is bringing down responsibilities f further down in the organization. Maybe a simple example is that if there was a conflict with a client uh, and you want to settle that and by giving him uh, a, an amount of money, you had to fill in papers and you had to send them to head office and they would look at it and after two weeks uh, they would decide whether it, you could settle it. Now, uh, we started with giving every employee of the bank the possibility to settle everything below 100 euro. So without any permission from anybody, we now raise that to 500 euro and it works. So it's a rather simple empowerment tool, but it shows that we trust our people. Uh, and we have to go further in that, in the way we work and bring back uh, power also to lower levels. Uh, a bit of a complication is that uh, at the same time, uh, supervisors are asking us to be in control as a board, you know. So there were quite a few policies which were settled below board level, but now have to be, uh, well, uh, approved also <coughs> at board level. So there is a bit of a contradiction between the way the supervisors want us to behave mm -hmm. and the way we think we should behave. Uh, and well, there are some signs of hope, but it's uh, at the same time that smaller companies are given more room in regulation. Yeah. The old companies are more and more, uh, we get a tsunami of regulation over us. Uh, and uh, so that makes it, a, but we still have a lot of things we invented ourselves and we can get rid of that. So that's where we should start. And then uh, at a later stage, maybe also official regulation uh, can be a bit uh, simplified because that is also uh, a, com a complex thing. On, at the same time, it works a bit as a protection wall, but you cannot, uh, it's an artificial protection wall for banks. And you cannot rely on an artificial protection wall. You should really be competitive and flexible and innovative yourself. In the presentation, Christina, we also saw a lot so, about digital so experience. I, want, I wanted to comment a thing because that's very interesting. I think that uh, because of regulation and many things, we have uh, tried to manage risks and to, and to control through procedures. And the thing is that in, in the time, the, the procedures have turned against the way we do business because they have become alibis for us to decide not to do things because they have become you know, difficult things to understand because it's very complex. So I think w what is key, and that's what we're trying to do, is to simplify. So the code of conduct says common sense. And so how do you develop common sense in people? Yeah. And, and, and you know, people, they know their customers, <coughs> they know the country they're working on. Uh, they know basically what they can and cannot do. And, and so let's let them operate as far as they can on their own with their common sense. So we're working a lot on things that are easy to explain so that we don't have to, or where is it written, and what's the procedure, and, and, and if I don't find it, then it's forbidden. It's the other way yeah. around. So, and if there is nothing, you know, there's, you can do fantastic things with big data. You can, you know, we, we're working on search engines that would make it very easy to ask questions or do things, and I have done this, is this correct or not? So you do it, you post it, and, and you will have an answer. That is correct here, and, and you can do it this way, and no, you cannot do it again, or don't repeat that, whatever. So technology also renders it very, very easy today to, to share best practices and to make sure that what I'm doing is right. I just have to go ahead and do it because it makes sense, and it makes sense for my customer, and it makes sense in the market I live. And so it's, it can be easy. I also want to touch about digital experience. So much is happening, and uh, how do you make sure you stay updated? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, well, I think I think that uh, it's 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 a very broad question because there's so much is happening. There's so many things uh, from blockchain to user experience and digital marketing. Uh, I think I think that it's important to, uh, you know, I see so many employees. We were talking with a couple of people yesterday night in the cocktail. Uh, I see so many employees that are very curious about what's going on, be it close to banking or, or further, because they have uh, they, they're entrepreneurs at night uh, during the weekends. Uh, the only thing is that we're not able to capture that energy, 
we, we consciously tell them when they walk into the bank, there's policies and there's a way of doing things and you forget to be intelligent and you forget to be curious and you forget to bring with you what your passion is. You know, you, Most people, you know, we deployed iPhones and uh, do we need to train people? And I said, no, I mean, they probably already have one at home. And <laughs> they, they know how to use them. So I think that that's, that's what we, so we, we count on that. We're trying for people that have, uh, uh, you know, affinities that work on things outside of the bank that are curious thing to foster that by giving them time to do that. Uh, by permitting them to experiment in the in the bank, so there are things that many other companies, Facebook does it with with hackathons or whatever. So it, it's just learning from from fintechs and other companies that have been successful and applying the same thing. So that that gives us a lot of of input, and uh, we have discovered talents that we didn't know we had. Uh, and obviously, we need to have uh, partnerships. We need to figure out ways of working with small, big companies because many of the, the key people that we need in the future do not want to be bank employees. Uh, and we have trouble. You're in or out. And, and either you're in and we trust you and you work in an environment we know, or we don't trust you and you're out and we cannot let you access our systems and our files and our client base. So, and, and that's a little tougher. Uh, but those are things that we know we need to do and that we're working on. Talking about these partnerships, that's where today is about. We're here with a room full of fintech entrepreneurs. Yep. What do you need from them, Gerrit? Well, interesting ideas and interesting products and services because we won't invent everything ourselves. Uh, there's no need for that and there are a lot of capabilities also outside the bank. And I must say, we, uh, of course, uh, the, there is a... Uh, you can criticize uh, the, the existing large banks, but at the same time, uh, we are very sexy and popular uh, for fintechs. Huh? <laughs> they, they love us, <laughs> and we like to work with them. Uh, so, uh, of course, you have to have inside uh, capacity too, but you can do a lot together with, with fintechs, uh, and we are actually doing that. And we're, there's also a possibility, if there is a need for that or demand for that, to invest in them. Uh, because if there's one thing big banks have, that's money. <laughs> so we can do investments too. <clears throat> so we, we, we have just uh, two words. We have this vision on IT where it's like, uh, you know, in the airports where, <clears throat> sorry, you have to, you know, walk from a one terminal to another and you have uh, the... the the, how do you call it, the tapis roulant in French, the, the, um, you know, you stand on it and it takes you with you. I don't remember the name. Yeah, so you, you, that, that's basically what we need to do. We need to be able to get on that tapis roulant so that, so that we can use much of the technology and expertise that's in the market. Uh, and, and that's the key thing. We need to make sure, like Apple has done with their Apple Store, we need to have people develop apps for us that we can use, that we can fit, APIs. Uh, so, so that's basically our IT strategy. How long do I take to get on the moving, right? And then I'm open to the market, and then I'm in market standards, and I can start disconnecting my <coughs> legacy chain. So. Well, banks get examined a lot by gray, old European male bureaucrats. So I can imagine you're looking forward to getting uh, cross-examined <coughs> by these two young entrepreneurs. So, Garrett, your <coughs> Grill the Keynote is coming up with David, but first we're going to grill Christina, and therefore I ask Jason Bates, the founder of Mondo, to come forward. <laughs> hey there. Well, Jason, you were listening to Christina to rate her chances of survival. What would be <laughs> the first questions you would ask her? Um, Wow, how do we start? Um, <coughs> my experience is that, that, that banks just don't get it. Um, that I, I tend to meet two types of people in, in banks. There's a, um, a, a, there are people who get it and people who don't. And people who get it, are, like Christina, are very few. Most see it as a commodity financial services product. You know, what are we doing? We're selling more of this widget. It's a current account. It's a savings account. It's a loan or a credit card. And it's been that way for a long time. Digital gets us in front of more customers. Digital makes it uh, cheaper in order to service that product. But, but that's it. And we can do great innovation on that. 
But that's, that's not going to win. That's, that's not even going to keep you in the market. Um, digital isn't another channel. It's an entirely new thing. You know, I did uh, quite a lot of digital transformation work with um, newspapers at one time who were really suffering. You know, they offer a, an analog uh, offering, an analog product in a digital world. No one's looking at newspapers anymore. And even taking the way that newspapers are made, you know, the way that a story is made by journalists, the way those organizations are, are organized, the way people are enumerated, the business models around them, no longer work in a real-time, intelligent, contextual, always-on world. And it's the same for banking. So the starting from, you know, okay, yes, banks have money and a lot of it, but there's a lot of money coming into fintech as well. And it's not two guys in a garage. These are the best experienced bankers, the best consumer technologists, the Google engineers, all coming together to create that next generation of, of financial services. And it doesn't look like it does now. It looks different. It's a service. It's so, a bit the lipstick on a pig argument you're making. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Christina, your reaction, please. Yeah, well, um, you know, I'm going to tell you how I learned. Um, I worked on the launch of Hello Bank. So Hello Bank is BNP Paribas Digital Bank. So it was launched in June uh, 2013. Uh, it, it was a massive experiment for BNP Paribas. Uh, I think six months along the line. Uh, so it was launched in four countries. Two of them worked well from the start, and two others had big difficulties, very difficult difficulties, very different difficulties. Um, and we realized that six months along the line, we were doing just that. We were recreating a retail bank, but on digital. And so it had the same mistakes. It was going the same route. It was not good on user experience. It was costly to run. And we were certainly not learning much. So we had to really start from an open page, white page, with redesigning entirely the way banking works. Uh, and what was good is that you know we, we had deadlines. The bank was launched. The clients were already there. So And then you see the power of a big organization that knows that it needs to make things a success. And, and it, it really, you know, the, the teams, the usual teams of the bank started working at it and started being creative and we, because we were forced to do it. So it was, you know, we, we learned that we needed to be humble and that we do not need to treat digital as a channel. It is a whole different experience. Otherwise, it's just, just the same bank again. And that's not what we wanted to do. So it was painful, uh, but it was certainly an eye-opener for, for a lot of people in the bank and for a lot of different departments of the bank. So, But I guess that, that, I mean, from my perspective, there are so many things against you, you know, in terms of the size of the organization seems like a benefit, but actually it can be a real hindrance. Small teams deliver amazing digital services and products. Yeah. Um, the, even the organization, the remuneration, uh, having people in positions of power who don't really understand how digital is done, what digital is, and how consumers' lives have changed. There seem to be so many layers, such a big uh, organization that through decades has evolved to deliver a particular product in an ever more efficient way. How does that become something totally different? And yet, that happened. <laughs> when decisions had to be made and we were in trouble, I saw top managers of the retail bank you know, decide we have to throw everything out. This will not work. We're just redoing the same thing. We're spending money. This is not working. And so they had to concretely understand uh, what it was retail banking needs to be successful and what user experience means and let people that they did not know and that knew little about banking make decisions that they could not make. So it, was, it, it, it can happen. I saw it happen. Uh, and obviously, it's going to be a big challenge to be able to, uh, tap, to have small teams and to have these small teams to be able to work in an environment that we manage because we need to manage. There are risks. We are responsible for what we do. We cannot go too far from that. So it will take a little bit of time, but it can't take that much time. It's, it's, a, it's a balance that we need to achieve. And, and that's not easy. I admit it. So I guess that leads me to the, the, the thing that actually the consumers I speak to uh, talk about, which is business model. You know, while everyone loves the fact that banks don't lose their money and they trust them to keep it, I don't think they trust that they won't try and charge them every, every aspect. No. Because in order, to, you know, at least in the UK, people want free banking, uh, yet 
thousands of staff, hundreds of branches, billions in legacy systems. Something has to pay for that. Where actually, with a new digital bank, that's you know that's not the case. Very different. So it's it's uh, so suddenly we're on the you know uh, a great a great digital bank can be a, like a great waiter rather than a bad landlord. <laughs> you know how do you uh, how do you address <clears throat> so that? So I think uh, David Breer said it very clearly. I think uh, we have uh, a lot of decision making to do. And it's probably going to be sometimes painful, uh, but it, but we are very conscious, at least in BNP Paribas, that it needs to be done. So it won't be easy. It needs to happen quickly. Uh, and uh, I think we have a, a bit of a grasp of, of which way to go. No, it might not be the right one. Uh, it's uh, I think that what's harder for people is to understand that <clears throat> you know we won't get it right the first time, and that every couple of months and for them it's years you know things change and they need to adapt and adjust so i'm confident that it's feasible and some places some business lines some countries will do better than others they will do faster some countries will not do and some business lines won't follow but uh, let's see where we get in, in do, do you see do you think the brand is a um, is a benefit or a hindrance because in some ways, you know, people are used to a particular, well, the, you know, it's, not, it's going to work, it's going to be perfect, it's going to be there. Making mistakes in public, it breaks that. Mm. And, you know, in some ways can, can damage, could damage the share price yeah. if you launch something and it's a mistake and doesn't work. Does yeah. that even work? Oh, again, so I, I think that, uh, well, Hello Bank is another experience for that. You know, the, the bank had the courage to launch Hello Bank in its home country, in France. And one of the the banks that did not work was Hello Bank France. It was the toughest decision to make. And yet it was decided to do so because it was the way to learn. Uh, I think, and obviously we, the brand was clearly supported by BNP Paribas, so it was not uh, hiding in another brand and pretending that it was not BNP Paribas. It was clearly BNP Paribas. Um, and, and I think we, we then got to basics. You know, you have to serve the customer right. You have to have a real value proposition. We had very interesting discussions about transparency in terms of pricing, in terms of the cost to, to do operations. Uh, and, and, you know, we really come to terms with what we're willing to give up and what we're not willing to give up and what it takes to be successful. So, again, it's decision-making. Some of those decisions are painful. It does imply an effort. It does imply, you know, explaining to a big organization that not all of it will win. So, but I think it can be done, and I think it's important to do it. I have one final question for you, Jason. Sure. You're a skeptic and undecided and optimist, would say, about the future of banks. Many fintech entrepreneurs, or a large part of them, also see their future in collaborating with banks and banks helping them become bigger. Isn't that a right strategy for them then, would you say? Uh, it, FinTech is just such a, ver such a very broad topic. <laughs> you know, for us personally, uh, and the, the challenger banks, you know, at least in the UK or across Europe, um, you know, we're looking to replace those banks. Uh -huh. Um, and there are, you know, in really interesting players coming up who are looking to take the position that banks would normally be as a platform for other fintechs, because they'll be in a, in, you know, offer the APIs and the connectivity and the cost base that makes that work. Um, so for, uh, you know, where are customers at the moment? They're with, they're with the big guys. So if you, if you have something that, that works directly with customers, and we have a, you know, an alpha and a beta sort of test at the moment that we're running on another bank's infrastructure because we don't have a banking license yet. So yes, there's definitely a place. Um, but I guess it leads to that question of, you know, do traditional banks become pipes for the guys who are doing the really interesting stuff? Or do, do they actually change in order to be able to lead that themselves? So we agreed with Jason yesterday that we would not launch anything in the UK, and he will not launch anything in France. <laughs> but it's conference yeah. had a result. So we agreed on that yesterday, <laughs> for the time being, for the time being. But you have to miss the French yeah. wine and the French food. <laughs> well, Stick he can come British. over, we can share a lot of things, but he won't open in France for now. I think she's scared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to both of you. <laughs>
now might be a good time for that fire alarm if anybody wants to, <laughs> anybody wants to help me out. Um, I, I think initially, if I, if I was made the, the, the CEO, I'd probably fire the HR department quite quickly just because how would that have happened, right? You know, what, what were they thinking, quite frankly, in terms of, uh, in terms of that decision going from today to that type thing? Um, I think the, the hardest thing from your position must be really understanding whether it's, uh, you know, to, from a medical perspective, is it easier to save the patient or is it easier to, to sort of know when to give in type thing, you know? So at, w- at what point do you, do you think actually it's, it's a, um, an easier thing to start something new on the side uh, in, a, in an M bank in, a, in, in the, the same sort of scenario that you've talked about with regards to BNP? Um, and it's too hard. You know, the, there's the, the sort of a, a lots of rhetoric about, you know, the sort of spaghetti in terms of knowing what's good and bad. Um, you know, I think if, if I was a new CEO and not having the ability to know the people in your, your management team and actually the experience of who's good and who's bad type thing, and I won't ask you for that one uh, now, that might, <laughs> might take it too, too far in terms of what we're doing. But without that experience, you've just got to presume that everybody was in the situation that got, got us to where we are type thing. So, and, and I know you guys have been doing some, some really good things to kind of move forward, both from a technology perspective and a, and a cultural one. Um, but you know, having seen what some of the banks are outside and the the amount of people, the amount of cost, uh, that is. Uh, you know the, the simplicity that they can deliver these things in. Then, uh, in the back of your head, must be: Is it easier for me to sort of build a new bank on the side and actually yeah. sit, start again? So, what, how, how well, ha- has that got run through your mind? And, and well, we do have a uh, purely uh, digital uh, daughter, uh, and for example, specialised in savings. Uh, and in Germany, we have about 10 billion of savings. Mm with only t- two people on the ground. Uh, so it's completely digitalized. Uh, so that, so I think we should, at, this, at the same time, uh, get rid of our old legacy IT infrastructure here in, in, in the modern bank, and at the same time not, you can also launch uh, your own challenger bank. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we are thinking about, not only for consumers, but also for private banking uh, uh, clients, but we are quite strong in private banking. Mm-hmm. And also for corporates, yep. especially smaller corporates. Uh, what is a bit uh, overestimated probably is the money we earn with payments. That's a very small part of our revenues. The biggest part of our revenues is net interest income, so the difference between what we pay on the liability side and what we get on the asset side. Uh, that's three quarter of our uh, uh, revenues and fees. But fees on payments in the Netherlands are very low. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, up till now, uh, most fintechs concentrate on, on, on payments. Uh, and uh, so that is not uh, the big wallet for us. So we need, to, of course, to, uh, uh, to renew the way we do things in terms of the way of working, but also in the terms of what we offer to our clients. And I agree that this, this customer journey is extremely important. And have, have you seen that starting to affect the supplier mix that you're looking at as well? Because you know, I'm I'm yep. sort of the the people who have, have worked with traditional banks have kind of got to a point. And I, from my perspective, I think fintech is actually as much of a, a challenge to the supplier chain in, in the mix as it is to the banks themselves. So you know, a lot of the guys yep. in, the, in the room today are, are looking to to work with you as opposed to you guys working with a an IBM or an yep. Accenture or whoever type thing. So. Yeah. We, we indeed now also cooperate. We, of course, we have uh, Infosys, we have uh, IBM and uh, the whole lot, the big techs. But we also cooperate, for example, for a uh, financial planning tool mm-hmm. with a fintech, uh, a Swedish fintech. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. And that works well. So I think we should, uh, have, first thing is awareness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, well, you helped a lot about uh, <laughs> creating awareness. And I think then the, the challenge for a large organization is how to, can you create small autonomous groups who are really making progress. Yeah. And uh, that's what we are uh, trying to do now. And that is a cultural revolution. It's not an evolution, it's a cultural revolution in my view. And of course we have to see whether it works. Mm. I, I think a, a large part of, I guess, a large part of your job at the, at the moment is is really finding the right people to give permission to give to support. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people sort of see the, you know, CEOs of organisations as the the person who should be sort of standing on the edge of the boat, kind of 
deciding the direction to go to. And, you know, in my, my experience, really, in most instances, it's about finding the right people, giving the yeah. right support, yeah. and really giving the air cover. Because, yeah. you know, by no means, given the fact that you're, you're breaking down barriers of, you know, processes and practices and governance models that have been in place for, you know, 30, 40, maybe 50 years in some instances type thing. So, you know, with that comes a lot of stress and strain. So, sure. you know, people don't like change generally in sure. terms of doing it. So sure. how have you kind of managed that transition? Because that must be, oh. you know, the thing that kind of keeps you up at night really is just yeah. making sure everybody's moving in the right direction. Well, if on the question of what keeps me awake at night, I, my answer is always my wife if I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Are we, are we recording this? Uh... Uh, I get a question from investors also. <laughs> and they like the answer. Uh, but uh, this is indeed... Uh, 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 but I think it's important is that you have clarity from the top. Yes. You know, if you... And you behave also like that. Yeah. And that you're also at the top, you're willing to give power to others. Yeah. And then you have to, of course, bring that down in the rest of the organization. Mm -hmm. And sometimes by simple means, uh, I, I mentioned this example of settling with clients, uh, that shows that we want uh, people to take their own responsibility. Uh, and uh, so we have to get rid of quite a lot of policies because everything is uh, set in rules and, 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 uh, and trust our people that they use their own creativity and their own have their own feeling of responsibility. Sure. And that makes work, of course, far nicer. Uh, and also have more simple uh, KPIs. So now we are concentrating, uh, we, we switch to a multiple of uh, KPIs to one major KPI, and that's the net promoter score. Uh, so that's the client centricity we try to ingrain in the organization in this way. Okay. One final question, Kenneth. We are here today in the spirit of collaboration. Is there something you want David to help you with at ABN Amro? <laughs> well, keeping us nervous is quite a good contribution. <laughs> because if you're not nervous anymore, you're certainly going down the drain. Absolutely. Wow. I want to thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this was the opening of the European FinTech Awards. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank our speakers, of course. I also want to thank ABN AMRO for hosting us today. also want to thank Hout of Buduma for hosting the conference yesterday. Now, of course, we're going through the day with a lot of pitches, a lot of breakout sessions, and the awards at the end of the day. But who better to tell us more about that than Tun? So, Tun, can you please come back? Can you explain uh, the people in the audience a little bit what they can expect today? Uh, I think Jason already mentioned that fintech is like a very broad uh, concept um, and we want to deep dive in trending topics in fintech. So what we're going to do now is by means of very interesting panel discussions and pitches of the most promising European fintech companies of Europe, we will deep dive into the trending topics. Um, so first of all, we will have a, a, a big break. Then we have a one room here, one room here, one room below. Um, most interesting uh, topics that can be discussed at the moment. At the end, like Kevin already said, we have the grand finale and we will announce the best fintech companies within the categories and we will have one grand uh, European fintech champion uh, tonight at around seven. Thank you very much. One more question. At what time will we know the European fintech champion of 2016? Um, I think about 7.30, but looking at the delay we already have, I'm not sure about that anymore. But so I think 7.30, maybe 8. I'm from Belgium, so I like to talk to Dutch audiences about European championships. Uh, that's, uh, thank you, Thun. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the day, and thank you for your attention now. <laughs>